Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Rachel Paul with IAAP and I'm also joined by Sam Evans from the IAAP team as well. And we're happy to have you here today for the webinar on building IT accessibility programs within organizations with Jeff Klein. Before we get started, just a few items to go over. All participant lines are muted just to prevent any background noise or disruptions. Closed captioning is available. You can select the closed captioning icon on your screen. And I also just posted in the chat a link to third party captioning if you prefer that option. Today's webinar will be recorded and available afterwards. So we'll make sure that all registrants get a copy of the link as well as a copy of the presentation slides. We will be taking questions and we will most likely hold till the end, but you're welcome throughout today's webinar to leave your questions in the chat or there is a Q&A box and we will get to all those as we go along. And I think that is it. So I'm happy to introduce and turn this over to Jeff Klein to get started today. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jeff. Um, or good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Let me get in here and get my screen shared. Okay, can everybody see my screen all right? Yes, sir. Okay, good, good. Well, um, I've got kind of a lot to cover here. Uh, most of it is um, is uh, included in the new release of my of my book, the second edition of Strategic IT Accessibility. Um, there's a lot of differences between the first edition and the second edition, and I just wanted to let you know that because what has happened over the almost 10 years since the uh, original was published is not only has the industry changed quite a bit, but also my thinking in, in several areas that uh, I hope everybody finds relevant and, um, and important. So let me just jump in here. I think the slides will be available uh, afterwards. Uh, so, um, you know, don't try to write anything down They're They're kind of dense. And I will uh, try to get through everything in about maybe 50 minutes or so. So we have some time for, for questions. So uh, let me go ahead and get started. <clears throat> I want to start with a little, um, with a little story. So uh, there's a company, we'll call it Corporation X, who's just get completed uh, the procurement of a large new web application for recruiting and, and managing, uh, you know, intake and setting all that up, you know, resumes, et cetera, et cetera. And it was developed by a software company, uh, Company A. They did lots of studies about, you know, how this was going to, you know, save a lot of money. They're going to reduce the headcount in that area of HR because this would all be automated, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they went ahead and they uh, de deployed it, rolled the folks off, <clears throat> and they began using it. And then there was a uh, programmer, let's call her Susan. And uh, Susan heard about a programming job at Corporation X, and she thought she would be a, a great fit for it. And so she decided she was going to apply. And so she got on the website and she started um, applying for this, uh, this position, but she couldn't because <clears throat> Susan, who was a crack programmer, was blind. She couldn't use the, uh, the application at all. So she tried to reach somebody, it took her a few days to kind of reach somebody from HR and recruiting to help with that because, of course, many of the people had rolled off. And they set up an appointment for the following week to take her application over the over the phone. So they called her about a week later, and uh, they said, "Okay, great. <clears throat> what is your um, the rec number that you're applying to?" And uh, she provided the rec number. And then uh, uh, Corporation XHR said, "Oh, I'm sorry, we just filled that position." So. She was a little bit dismayed, and, and like a lot of people with disabilities, they tend to be pretty active on the discussion forums that are, you know, related to their, uh, you know, to their kind of uh, audience. And there was a civil rights attorney on who kind of monitors things like that, and he contacted Susan, and he said, well, you know, 
I'm going to try to reach out to this company and see if I can help them um, get, um, you know, just kind of help them to help them understand that this is important and maybe they can make changes and things like that. And, you know, all the implications of not being accessible. So he spent, you know, they, they bounced him around three or four different places over the course of a couple of weeks. And he realized that uh, they were just giving him the stiff arm and not really all that interested. So um, he worked with, with Susan and they filed a lawsuit under title two of the American disabilities act with, for discrimination. And that's kind of how it all starts, right? So when you look at the, you know, the plethora of errors that occurred through this thing, what, you know, what happened? Well, let's start with Corporation X. <clears throat> they didn't really know anything about accessibility. Um, I would like to say that that's hard to believe in this day and age, but unfortunately it isn't. But, you know, in this case, they didn't really know anything about IT accessibility. The requester who wanted the application, namely the HR group, <clears throat> didn't have any accessibility requirements built into the statement of work or the, uh, or the product requirements. There was no language uh, <clears throat> on the procurement side with regard to solicitation. There was no accessibility evaluation, no documents requested like VPATs. There was no contract language, et cetera, et cetera. And the company really didn't have a, uh, an IT accessibility policy, which is hopefully as we go through this thing is going to be fundamental to the you know, to the success of uh, a, a program anywhere. Now let's look at company A. They didn't know anything about accessibility themselves, or if they did, it really wasn't uh, any kind of a priority. They had no technical knowledge or skills in that arena. <clears throat> so even if they wanted to do something, they likely couldn't in any kind of a responsive fashion. Uh, no accessibility criteria integrated into their <clears throat> development process or their final results. So obviously, if that isn't integrated, the probability of an accessible product coming out at the end of the uh, pipeline is, is pretty, uh, pretty low. And guess what? They didn't have an accessibility policy either. A lot of finger pointing. And of course, you know, once uh, the legal teams get involved, <clears throat> you know, Corporation X uh, then decided that uh, this was software company A's fault, and so they, they filed a lawsuit against them, and, and that's when the fun begins. So I just wanted to share this one slide with you. It's an example of where these kind of accessibility impacts can occur uh, in any kind of an organization. This is not a comprehensive list, but they can you know, once one of these things is identified in any area, whether it's internal or to a, a customer, it can, it can have a lot of impact throughout <clears throat> in any kind of an organization. And that's, that's kind of a, a important to realize. Also keep in mind that when one of these things hits, you're going to get a lot of executive help. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure I, I use that term, um, you know, kind of uh, as an oxymoron. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. It's, it can be very serious business and it impacts a lot of areas in terms of cost, uh, money and uh, bad goodwill. So I'm sure a lot of you know that, you know, the uh, accessibility complaints are on the rise. They're filed as discrimination under the ADA in, in the United States. Um, not exactly sure. I, I follow the uh, U.S. stuff more closely than than the rest of the world, given my position. But <clears throat> you know, there are other regulations in other parts of the world. Um, congratulations to Domino's for becoming the replacing Target as the poster child for uh, accessibility issues. You know, the lawsuit went to the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, got kicked back down, so it's it's stood. And I know that that's still ongoing, but um, anyway, I want to throw that in there. And then um, you know the number of federal website lawsuits is is nearly tripled, and they were coming in at the rate of about one an hour for a while. Um, <clears throat> the drive-by lawsuits um, have been out there. Uh, there's been a lot of that. They've been tapering off recently because um, a lot of the courts have ruled that they didn't really have an ind you know, good standing because there wasn't an actual individual who had been harmed. 
Uh, and then, of course, um, they've been trying for years to codify uh, technical standards <clears throat> under the ADA through the Department of Justice, but um, they haven't been able to do that. The last effort has been uh, inactive for more than a few years now, but um, you know, it's important to realize the DOJ still calls websites places of uh, public accommodation, and then a lot of the settlements do use WCAG 2.0 whatever it is, the latest version, double A, <clears throat> as the technical standard for compliance. So there's regulations uh, all over the world. <clears throat> uh, in most countries, most of them cite accessibility technical standards, such as WCAG. You know, you've got the federal procurement regulations, and it's always important to call this out, that U.S. Section 508 is a federal procurement regulation, applies to federal <clears throat> government agencies, and so, but, however, many other um, government bodies and other people do point to that. They reference to it to pick it up. American Disabilities Act, which uh, I just mentioned, the technical standards, its standard isn't currently uh, codified. But there are, um, you know, regulations in many states, one of which is, is, uh, is the state of Texas. It applies to all government agency, Texas state agencies and state-funded institutions. And we've got several administrative codes that, um, you know, that apply. And uh, there are links to those from this, um, from this presentation. Once you have it, you can go out there and link to those and take a look at, uh, take a look at those. And most of the standards, as I said, re reference 508 or WCAG. So if you look at kind of what I've been talking about here over the last um, few minutes, you know, accessibility can be a pretty complicated topic. Um, in order to really um, resolve it within an organization, it requires, there's a lot of moving parts <clears throat> and a, there's a lot of challenges. There's, there's technical challenges, there's organizational challenges, there's legal and, and cultural, and it touches uh, organizations uh, in different ways, depending on what the, uh, the role of the organization or the mission is. You know, trying to get there overnight and claim that you can fix everything pretty fast is, is a fallacy. You know, it's typically going to be a multi-year initiative for an organization of any size. And the, the speed and the scope and the, you know, success of execution <clears throat> is going to have some, some pieces as well. You know, how fast do you want to do ramp up your training? Do you have tools and process, you know, budgets? And then most importantly, you know, a level of management commitment and, and support and uh, that has to be beyond just, uh, just lip service. <clears throat> so even when, you know, we see all this uh, regulatory push and litigation, um, adoption is still pretty slow. And there, you know, there's two areas of that. One are the technical challenges with accessibility you know, the continued in investment in legacy products and platforms. A lot of these products that are out there, they've been building on their code base for, <clears throat> you know, 10 years. And um, that creates some really difficult challenges when they're trying to integrate accessibility. And they can maybe sneak it into some of the later modules, but the underlying code isn't. So that becomes problematic. And then when people are developing uh, new technologies, you know, they don't really think about accessibility from the get-go. Therefore, it's not factored in, and it has to be somehow reverse engineered by someone else down the road. <clears throat> but so those are the technical challenges. And uh, the other part of this is what I call the organizational challenges. And you could see that from the, uh, the issues that I identified in that, in that scenario earlier, you know, lack of awareness of the accessibility or the technical standards around it. Maybe that's deemed unnecessary or optional. Gee, that would be great to do. Um, sometimes it's understood too late in a project. Somebody goes, well, what about accessibility? And they say, well, we're already down the road. We'll, we'll fix it next time. Lack of knowledge, technical skills, training, et cetera. But these last two are very important. <clears throat> no organizational policies or objectives related to accessibility and no one responsible or accountable for accessibility. So I would argue today that, you know, there's a, a very good 
uh, supply of, uh, of knowledge and tools related to accessibility, you know, how to uh, fix websites, how to develop uh, development tools, you know, HTML5 and, and, and way ARIA, lots of things like that. And so it's not really in its infancy anymore. It's become pretty mature. But um, unfortunately, um, all this technological enablement has really not been a, um, an adoption driver for getting accessibility integrated into products and services. The technical standards are not execution criteria, they're governance criteria. And there's nothing in today's technical standards that address governance. And we don't really see any silver bullets on the horizons for uh, solutions to accessibility. So it's still going to be a manual uh, process, manual integration for the foreseeable future. So let's talk about this, um, this governance criteria for a second. These are some examples of some places where um, uh, governance models have, are starting to converge. <clears throat> so there was a directive by the OMB a few years ago, talked about strategic plan for accessibility, and it goes into, you have to have policy requirements, you have to have the skills and training uh, and reporting back, and then organizational process and planning requirements. And then uh, I use AOTA as an example. You know, they, they mirror that. They've got this, the same kinds of things. There have been several settlements uh, across the DOJ and the DOE and many more probably since I created this slide. So you can see this commonality of stuff that, that these bodies are presenting and saying, you need to do these things. You need to do these things. These are not technical, but these, this is governance. So one of the ideas was is... Um, should this governance criteria be made less ad hoc and more formalized? <clears throat> and so um, myself and uh, my counterparts in, uh, in Massachusetts, Sarah Bourne and Jay Wyant in Minnesota, worked with the National Association of, of State CIOs um, <clears throat> to build what was called policy-driven adoption for accessibility. And what this is, is, is a governance uh, model uh, that integrates accessibility into, into organizational policies that drives the organizations in a way that helps them really drive themselves to improve accessibility adoption. Once you integrate accessibility into policy, it becomes, it, it integrates into the culture, assuming that uh, these organizations actually uh, implement their own policies. It makes it very difficult to ignore it's not really prescriptive. It tells them kind of what to do, but not specifically how to do it. Uh, it can be governed through non-technical methods for the most part. And it can, you know, once this catches on culturally and policy-wise in an organization, uh, it, accel it accelerates innovation. And you see that all the time in places like, uh, I'll use some examples of in, in uh, Apple, um, Facebook, Microsoft. <clears throat> uh, all of them are now gotten onto the, the program and, um, and working towards, and you're starting to see integration and, and innovation. And not only does it, um, it help people with disabilities, but it helps um, the general population as well. So you can stop talking about accessibility and really start talking more about inclusive design. All right, so let's talk a little bit about policy-driven adoption. Um, there are six core criteria that we developed, and over on the left side are the, um, the kind of the areas, the topic areas that these things came from. So first and foremost is policy creation. You need to make sure, you know, you need to develop, implement, and maintain an IC policy in your organization. The second <clears throat> criteria is organizational, which means establish and maintain an organization structure that enables and facilitates progress in ICT accessibility across the organization. Then business processes, where you need to integrate accessibility criteria into the key business processes as they're identified where accessibility plays a role, including procurement, uh, acquisitions, and other relevant business processes making compliance planning, which is make sure that you have a process for addressing an accessible ICT. 
then training, of course, ensure the availability of relevant uh, ICT skills either within or to the organization. By two, I mean with a third party. Um, and then making all this information or some aspects of this information available when requested. Uh, and um, here in the state of Texas, we do request that stuff. And so you're asking them to not only do this stuff, but you know, provide documentation that it is in fact uh, being done. So these are the core criteria <clears throat> that we developed. And um, when you look at what the value of, of this stuff is, um, you know, a fully implemented PDAA, you know, it, it, when somebody's organization is doing that and they're actually creating products, it's going to create a competitive advantage in solicitations when uh, there are requirements for accessibility, which is almost all the time now, you would hope. Um, it could gain uh, additional market share with the expansion of customer base as a result. Um, it's a great thing for your brand equity and social responsibility. Um, you know, search engine optimization um, is also um, is also um, has some additional features because you know when you do captioning of a video, you know those captioned videos can be out there and searched, and a number of other things for that CEO. And then internally, it allows you to uh, the ability to hire and retain people with disabilities, so you don't run into a problem like uh, <clears throat> like Susan in the original scenario. And then risk mitigation when ADA complaints and litigation arises, because if you can demonstrate that you're you're on a path to do this, you know, to make your your products and services accessible, you do get some credit for uh, for effort in that in that arena. All right, so a little bit more detail in the maturity model, you know, in the, uh, the core criteria <clears throat> we have across the, uh, in the first column there. And then we have three um, areas of maturity, the launch phase, the integrate phase, and the optimize phase. <clears throat> and if you look across the bottom of the slide, you can see kind of a, um, a, a bar chart, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, that gets populated uh, through a questionnaire that is also part of this maturity model. But, you know, I don't need to get into read this chart out loud, um, but what you, you can have a look at it and you can see that what it is is just increasing degrees of maturity towards supporting that core criteria in each one of those, uh, in each one of those categories. So as part of this, <clears throat> that bar chart, you know, we created a, a self-assessment tool. Um, it's in the form of a uh, Excel spreadsheet, although I think Jay has been working in, in uh, Minnesota to try to uh, convert it into a web uh, application for, for vendors. Um, it asks a lot of questions about <clears throat> accessibility policy, the core criteria. And as a vendor or any organization responds to it, it starts to populate this bar chart. And at the end, it tells you where you are on, you know, in terms of uh, accessibility maturity within your organization. So when you do that, it's, it's important to realize that, you know, we talk about this being used in procurement, but you can use it in any public or private sec sector organization to just to gain a high level perspective on where you are on the scale you know are you mature are you you know are you really lacking in a lot of areas and then you can actually use the uh, the results of that to put together a um, you look at the gaps and, and put together an accessibility program now for procurement um, it's what's useful about it is it really can help when you look at that uh, result you know, it helps you assess a vendor's ability to produce accessible offerings. And um, it can help you kind of gauge the confidence in the other documentation. So if they, if they score very low here, but um, it looks like their, their VPATs or their or other documentation, they kind of look like they're, you know, everything is supported, everything is supported. You kind of have to figure out how to reconcile those things. But one of the other interesting things is if you work with the same vendor over, over a period of time for multiple solicitations or products, and they fill this thing out every time, you can actually track their, their progress you know, on their initiatives. 
And it could be that after, you know, three or four times or over a couple of years, you don't see any movement in this. You know, at some point you might say, well, this is too much risk and maybe we don't want to do business with this vendor anymore. And, you know, so of course you can use it as part of the uh, vendor selection process. <clears throat> and I'll, I will show you that a little bit later. But right now I wanted to go through kind of each one of those core criteria into some, uh, a little bit of detail if my voice holds up, that is. So criteria one, right? This is the, really the most important. It creates a foundation on which your whole program and initiatives can be built. If you don't have uh, a policy in your organization, then you're relying on, you know, individuals at different places to kind of bring it up. Um, trying to create an, accessible, an accessibility program from the bottom up um, is, is not a way that I would recommend. You need to start at the top and, and come down. I'll, I'll have some other stuff I can share with you on that in a few minutes. <clears throat> the other thing is when you have a policy, now you've got, you have continuity of the accessibility effort throughout the whole organization <clears throat> rather than, you know, these tactical efforts when one product manager thinks it's important to make their product accessible or to buy something accessible the whole organization kind of has that marching order to move forward. And it helps people understand in different roles uh, in their organization that it's important and understand what that means to them. You know, whether you're a content producer, whether you're creating documents, whether you're a developer, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're creating a, a policy, <clears throat> you know, I get a lot of questions. Well, can you give me an example of a policy and, um, you know, I could do that, but, but there's so many of them out there that are published, um, you know, that might be tailored more specifically to your needs. You can find a lot of that information <clears throat> out on the web for different kinds of companies and, and public sector organizations. But some of the basic questions that need to be asked by the organization are, you know, some of the ones I outlined here. You know, why do we need that policy? You know, what do we need to do? Who's responsible? Where does it apply in the organization? When should it take effect and how do we execute? Those are some fundamental uh, questions that need to be kind of answered in an accessibility policy. When you try to develop a, uh, a policy, you know, it shouldn't be done in a vacuum. Um, I show a, a, a Venn diagram here of a, uh, <clears throat> a core team for, to the develop a policy where you might want to get somebody in from uh, industry as an accessibility expert who's got some experience developing um, policy. Um, you know, you've got your internal uh, policy and governance team who knows how to speak that language, who knows how to format it who's going to kind of coach you on how that will integrate into the culture of the organization. And then you have to have somebody there from a, a technical perspective to make sure that you're not really overstepping or kind of gauging how um, aggressive, I think you might want to say, to, to make that policy. Then, you know, you've got the uh, development team and then you've got the stakeholders. And the stakeholders are places in the, in the organization like HR, legal, procurement, development, all the people that are going to be impacted by these, uh, by a, an accessibility policy. <clears throat> and so once you have drafts of this policy, you're going to get review and concurrence. You know, you go back and forth until everybody is, is pretty comfortable. <clears throat> and then maybe they need to formally sign off or at least agree that, um, you know, that the policy is good and, and is in place. But if you just try to do it without that uh, and then just roll it out, you'll have people coming out of the woodwork screaming at you. So, uh, you know, you want to try to minimize that and make it a, a smooth uh, transition as possible. Then the second uh, criteria is uh, establishing and maintaining uh, an organizational structure, as we, we talked about, right? So you need to kind of figure out where you want to place the accessibility function within the organization. Um, I call that a core accessibility function. Um, in a smaller organization, that may be all you need. If it's larger, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the other thing that's important is you need to designate and accept an executive champion or sponsor. You know, somebody that's got 
accessibility stamped on their forehead. Uh, sometimes it's called a, a CAO, but Chief Accessibility Officer. But I would argue that um, it needs to be even a level above that um, because somebody who's, who understands the business at a different level, a VP of, of uh, <clears throat> I don't know, it could be HR or internal IT or research, number of those things. And then um, ensuring that uh, you've got focal points within the organization, you know, in other places so that, um, you know, they don't have to come to the core area all the time. So you've got somebody in these organizations working with them. And I'm going to show a slide, right? Uh, this next slide kind of articulates that a little bit more. <clears throat> you know, a senior manager is an executive sponsor. Now you see in the, in the, uh, in the illustration, the, except centralized program, and then kind of dotted line um, to what we call the subunits or the divisions, whatever they're called within your, your culture, where you've got a, a focal point over there. He kind of soft, uh, you know, works with the centralized program, but actually uh, gets paid. We, we would use the expression that that organization that they work in, that subunit actually holds their card. And then, of course, if you have a really large organization, you may want to have focal points at, a, at another level. And so this, this uh, bubble chart tends to uh, expand out. Um, you need an executive sponsor. Um, you, when you pick where this thing, uh, this function for the uh, centralized organization, you need to find a place, uh, what I call neutral placement. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that, I think, in the next slide and figure out what you want in that accessibility function that's centralized, you know? So, you know, truly there needs to be uh, policy and governance. That's where it should reside. Uh, maybe technical consulting. If you're a private sector organization, you may want to have somebody there, uh, you know, on the bus business development and sales support side, project office. Again, this is going to depend more on the culture of the organization <clears throat> than any kind of a list I can just generate here. And then the subunit focal points would be responsible for training the people within their organizations, um, you know, have the techno technical expertise to help them, and then to be able to establish and drive metrics, either, either if they're established through the centralized program or for their own uh, divisions or subunits. So neutral placement, you know, we really, it's really important to make sure that you put this function in a place in the organization that's going to be effective across the organization. I don't know that there's really any uh, optimum spot in any organization. And so you have to try to get as close as you can. This is a uh, <clears throat> kind of an example chart that you can use, a table where you look at the organization and then just write down the pros and cons for each one of those. So if you put it in your IT development shop or you're, where you're uh, building products for market, <clears throat> is that going to be conducive? You know, how will you really be effective with the internal IT? Um, you know, what about the HR department? Would that be with recruiting? Um, you know, could that really handle the uh, recruiting? Now, it would probably be, you know, help optimize the products that you're selling, but these other areas, you know, could end up lacking. You know, so you can kind of go down this list, you can generate other areas, you know, some organizations have a compliance area where it might be a, a good fit <clears throat> back in IBM. I'm not sure where it is now, but uh, they had it in the research uh, division, which was a kind of a neutral uh, organization that could reach across uh, everything. So you really have to do some critical thinking on that to figure out where to establish it and, uh, and go forward with the proposal. <clears throat> and then when you're doing a uh, initiating an accessibility program, you know, you're going to get in front of these executives and they're going to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I bought in. What's it going to cost me? So you need to have some kind of an idea of what that's going to cost. Um, there's various kinds of funding models. Um, I'm not going to get into that here, but, um, uh, you know, I talk about it in my book. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is going to be determined by how, how fast you want to get there, right? You know, is, if it's if it's urgent based on business or other requirements, you know, and budget considerations, and then I kind of divide the, uh, you know, what's needed into into startup and ongoing costs. 
<clears throat> and for the most part, it's the HR or the, you know, the technical uh, people and skills to do that. And then, um, you know, the hardware and software that's needed to support, uh, you know, the program, either at the, you know, and should try to include, you know, everything from the centralized program to some guesstimates on what it's going to cost uh, the individual subunits, et cetera. So all I have here is, is really just, I don't have any numbers in there, obviously, because that, that wouldn't make any sense, but kind of the in investment levels that you need to be thinking about. So uh, at the startup uh, investment levels, you're going to have a, a degree of um, high, medium, and low investment that you're going to need. And then the ongoing, once you get the program up and running, <clears throat> how do you continue that? in a meaningful way. And uh, some of the costs are, of course, are gonna go down uh, once you get the, the program up and running. So this is always something to consider. Um, you need to make sure that you really think about this when you're going forward to propose a program in your organization um, to avoid being shot. And then once you start down the road in the organization, you know, building this program, what do I fix first? What's, what are the most important areas? This is just one kind of an example of that, um, of prioritizing the work effort. It's an inverted triangle. Um, <clears throat> you know, what, the way I kind of have this divided up is, you know, in many cases, the externally facing uh, things that, are, uh, that you're doing in your company <clears throat> or your organization, uh, mission critical, high number of users, high revenue uh, is probably the, one of the critical ones. Maybe not so much the high revenue, but um, that can be a delineator, but the high number of users, I think, um, you know, kind of uh, can articulate uh, the risk. Non-mission critical, just kind of going down the, the pyramid, down to non-mission critical, low number of user kinds of things, right? Maybe some specialized area, <clears throat> of a website that's needed, you know, for some reason that's not really, that generally isn't used very often. And then you've got your internal use stuff. And, you know, of course, that's going to uh, depend on how big your organization is. Uh, if you've got hundreds of thousands of uh, employees, you know, maybe that needs to go up into the upper part of the, of the uh, inverted pyramid. <clears throat> you know, starting again with mission critical, high number of users down, down lower. I do have a little asterisk there. If you're doing new development of products, uh, that always needs to be a uh, priority within any one of those priority classes because everybody knows that if you bake it in while you're building the product initially, um, you're going to be much more successful at making it accessible than trying to go back in and, and test it. Then criteria three, um, you know, making sure that uh, you've got accessibility developed, uh, integrated into the, the key business processes to make sure that it's repeatable and it happens <clears throat> all the time and you're not de dependent on these torch carriers to stand up and say, oh, we need accessibility. And then, uh, you know, depending on what the product managers and others want to do, you know, you may get it and you may not. So this is just a, um, a, a just an illustration of an analysis of a, of a process looking at uh, an existing process. If you look closely, you'll see a blue square around the word test at the bottom. When we looked at the process analysis, that was the only place where accessibility was actually formalized in, the, in this whole complicated uh, process. <clears throat> when we started looking at the process, we identified key issues in, in a lot of these uh, major areas, and you can see the key issues along the left side, and then the needed actions along the right side. And everywhere you see a green uh, triangle is where accessibility needed to be integrated in some way or another. So this is kind of a good way to, to uh, look at a process, um, you know, to see where accessibility is going to play a role and how to integrate it into those processes. Criteria four, make sure that you've got a plan for uh, addressing uh, ICT long-term and short-term. Um, <clears throat> you know, so that what that means is, is, you know, do you handle, how do you handle corrective actions? Do you, do they, do you put them in the tracking systems? How are they prioritized? Um, maybe if you're buying a, a product that's not accessible, will the vendor be able to fix it? When will they be able to fix it? You, or do you have to re-procure it at a different, uh, different date? 
Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, is there a way to provide an alternate means of access? Maybe that's uh, 800 numbers, uh, you know, maybe for an internal thing, maybe your manager has to come into your office and help you with that. Uh, make sure that 800 people or the technical support is trained, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, making sure that you've got skills available to the organization, uh, either within or to, you know, and so what you need to do is, is figure out where the gaps are in accessibility and then provide training opportunities. Uh, you have, it's very important when you're doing uh, hiring developers and programmers that you want to ask them if they've got those skills when you're hiring and put those in the job descriptions. If they're not there, nobody's going to know about it and you can hire developers and they may know nothing about accessibility and, and you need to do that. And so now you've got the expense of trying to train them and then tracking and managing the gaps. <clears throat> um, this is an example of a role based training plan. Uh, you can see kind of some courses fictitious courses that are kind of identified in either like the level or fundamentals, let's say, you know, the top three, all staff needs to have an intro to accessibility, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera, office documents. And then as you go through the fundamentals, depending on what the roles are, you know, content producers have to do more, um, you know, have more uh, training that's required, web application developers even more, more in advance and all the way into specialized where you're gonna have some other training for like procurement people, et cetera. So you can build one of these, um, you know, you can use this as a guide, you can you could build one depending on your culture, but this is a good way to, uh, to understand, you know, the, the gaps <clears throat> and build a, tra a training plan around them. And then the last one is really making information available to your, to your customers. Um, you know, it's going to encourage some formalized tracking and management of the PDA initiatives and it, uh, you know, it's going to provide customers with information for gauging your, uh, your abilities. <clears throat> so I think that's it for the policy driven adoption. I, that was a pretty good overview. I've got more detail, uh, of course, in the book. But I want to make sure we have some time to talk about procurement, because that's a real hot topic everywhere right now. Um, <clears throat> almost everything that anybody uh, uses within an organization is procured. Uh, most of it, a good deal of it, doesn't meet accessibility standards today. And, um, you know, nobody's going to be building everything themselves uh, that they're using within their, within their companies for obvious reasons. <clears throat> Vendors provide documentation, but how good it is it? Um, you know, for commercial off-the-shelf products, we have VPATs, um, but the accuracy of what's in those VPATs varies wildly from vendor to vendor, product to product. I'll talk about that. And then, you know, when you're buying a development services to develop an application or a website, there are no VPATs. So, um, you know, how do you assess the levels of uh, commitment and <clears throat> skill levels in those organizations? The example I like to use is, um, you know, with regard to getting something from a, uh, a vendor, <clears throat> you know, who validates accessibility, at, you know, during this thing. So you go out and you buy, a, you're looking to buy a new car, you want a very, very safe car. You do all the research. You go, yes, this is the safest car. This is the one I'm going to get because I, I know that this is the safest. I read all the information. Are you going to go drive it into a wall to see if it meets the uh, safety standards? Of course you aren't. Well, let's hope so. <clears throat> um, so really, I argue that the burden of proof in terms of the, you know, how accessible products and services are belongs to the vendor and not the customer. What you need to get from the vendors is credible evidence of their of the products, you know, that they've, they've done what they needed to do. And I'll talk about that. You know, make sure that you've got contractual language in there when you're doing deals with them that really, you know, is solid. And then a, a, a statement of uh, compliance from them that they did everything and, and uh, you know, there's probably things that they identified that need to get fixed <clears throat> and just have a statement certifying that. When you do that, that really reduces the level of effort needed by customers who are buying these products to do the testing. I don't need, if, if you're a customer, why should you do all the testing of a, of a uh, 
of a vendor product that they've done for you or that they've uh, a commercial off the shelf product. Ask them for the credible evidence. So show me what you did. How did you do it? When you're analyzing VPATs, you have to be skeptical. Um, I, in our cooperative contracts program, I literally review thousands of these things. <clears throat> and most of what I see, not so much from the big guys, you know, uh, the large uh, IT vendors, but many of the mid-size and small ones, they're, you know, false, inaccurate, misleading information. Uh, they're done without performing testing. But still, you need to have somebody who's qualified to look at these things, um, you know, be able to do that analysis. I've got a, a bunch of red flags here on this, uh, on this slide. <clears throat> I want to, uh, you know, you can read, read along with those, um, you know, when you get the slide deck. Once it's available, I'd, I could cover them here, but I know I'm running a little short on time. But then the other thing is, is once you, you get those, uh, those uh, questions, once you get the, do the analysis on the VPATs, you know, ask some questions. Okay, Mr. Vendor, what tools and methods were you used to test and complete the VPAT? What client platforms, and when I mean client platform, what operating systems, <clears throat> browsers, assistive technologies were used as test environments? Can you provide what the test plans were for the product? Can you share the results? What issues were found? And are there corrective actions in place to resolve them? Uh, or are they going to be in a substitute, substantive uh, sub subsequent release? And when will that be? So just asking those kind of questions. Now, we talked about um, development services. There is no such thing as a VPAT. So in the state of Texas, we developed this form called the VATSER, Vendor Accessibility Development Services Info Request. We asked them a series of kind of open-ended questions in the solicitation uh, when they're signing up for development services. And depending how they answer, we will typically come back to them with a, uh, a hold a phone call with them to discuss their responses, especially if the responses look very questionable. <clears throat> and sim some of the stuff is similar to PDAA questions, but it's not. Um, you know, describe the specific skills and training and resources that, uh, that you use. Describe your key business processes where accessibility is integrated. What are the development and test tools within your organization that you use? Uh, can you provide examples of test cases um, and examples of how test results are documented? <clears throat> can you describe your organization's uh, corrective actions? alternate methods, and number six is really the kicker, provide links to example websites or other ICT work that your organization has produced that meet 508 or WCAG AA. So you can, when you get this back, you can tell pretty quickly if they know anything about accessibility. And then, you know, you can go out to these websites that they provide. I usually go out there and I run a page check on them just to see, um, you know, what they look like. And then the other thing I do is I'll go to their vendor homepage, just their, on their website. I'll run a page check on that to see if they're eating their own dog food. And, um, you know, if they can't adequately respond to this form, and even after we've had a subsequent uh, discussion with them, uh, you know, from a DIR perspective, we will not permit them, <clears throat> we will not issue a development contract um, or cooperative contract for them uh, to do work for us. When you say no and they get denied, um, guess what? <clears throat> um, you're taking food out of their mouth and that's gonna make them a little bit more hungry and so they will start to put the right plans in place to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So it's, it's a little bit of tough love, but you know, it's for the greater good. And this is a, a example of scoring um, a, uh, a solicitation. In this particular one, we've got um, the VPATs, this particular solicitation might have a combination of commercial off the shelf, development services, and then PDA always. So I have a scoring uh, method that I developed that goes from zero to three. Zero meaning, you know, VPATs are needed, but uh, they weren't provided, you know, all the way up to credible uh, documentation, the VPATs look really good. <clears throat> 
Um, and then I assigned a, uh, I tried to normalize that by assigning a, a point assignment for each one of those, <clears throat> one, zero to three. Uh, three being 100 points, uh, zero being zero, of course. And then the Vatser score, <clears throat> that is either, that's binary, that's either sat, you know, sat or unsat, meaning, you know, you have no confidence in what they provided you and they can't produce an accessible website or a sat um, a rating of 100. And then the PDA score is, is what it is. So let's say, for example, that in this particular solicitation, you were going to be uh, accessibility is up to 15% <clears throat> of the score for the um, to figure out whether you're going to award a contract or not. So you, let's look at how this particular vendor scored. Okay, on the Dev Services, they scored uh, satisfactory, uh, so they did know what they were talking about there. Uh, on the VPATS, they were you know, they, they were a little bit weaker on that. So they got a two assignment there, but their PDAA score was, was high, assuming that was uh, credible. And so when you, when you add the, the number values together on those <clears throat> and then divide it by three, you come up with 85, you know, out of a possible 100, 85.67% on that, uh, of the possible uh, score of 100. So the overall satisfactory is, is high. Um, and then uh, you take that, what is, because that's worth 15% of the bid value, you just use that as a multiplier, 0.15 by that score, and they get a final score of 12.85. So out of 15 points, uh, their final, they did, they got 12.85 for accessibility, and then that would go into the other components of, of the bid. I hope that I, I explained that properly, um, and that it's, it's, it's a pretty straightforward way to do it. There's lots of other ways um, that are, you know, more, um, probably more complex. You could weight things a different way. I like to keep things simple. And then when you have, um, uh, when you are buying something that's not accessible, or something comes back from development that's not quite there yet, um, you know, you probably need to have that documented somewhere. In some places they call it an exception. <clears throat> it's really an, a risk acceptance. So you wanna fill out a, a risk acceptance form before the actual IT is, um, is deployed. And, you know, that should be uh, signed by somebody pretty high up in the organization who's willing to accept the risk. <clears throat> so an exception, you know, doesn't eliminate the risk. You could still have a lawsuit. That's why it's called a risk exception, uh, acceptance. That doesn't uh, eliminate any responsibility for an accessible solution. It should provide a good justification why uh, you had to purchase that particular piece of non-accessible IT. And it should include a plan for uh, compliance in the future. Um, alternate means of access, uh, you know, 800 service, desk side, you know, the vendor provided a, a roadmap of when they're gonna be, um, you know, when their product is gonna be compliant. And then you should have it signed by the, the head of the agency or the head of the division or organization so that <clears throat> the risk is in the right place needs to be done before the contract is awarded. So that person, rather than a rubber stamp, they can go, okay, hey, wait a minute, I wanna understand this a little bit better. You know, give them, you know, the ability to reject it, you know, because they are gonna be the one whose signature is on that. So that comes to the end of the uh, presentation. Um, I think we've still got some time for questions. There's some, uh, a slide with some additional information on it. You know, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't put in another shameless plug for the book. Um, I think it's really valuable information for everybody to have. Make sure that when you go out to Amazon that you look for the second edition. It's available in, <clears throat> in uh, ebook format and, uh, and paperback. And then uh, policy-driven adoption documents are out on the NASIO, NASIO website. They give you some more detail on that and some other uh, helpful um, other helpful information. So I still have part of my voice back. I wanna thank everybody for uh, taking the time to listen to this. I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep and um, hopefully there'll be a few questions I can help answer now. So I will turn it uh, back over to, uh, to Rachel. 
All right. Thank you, Jeff. We do have quite a few questions coming in, so maybe we'll try to get through as many as we can, but possibly we can take down all these questions and follow up with you and then have a Q&A posted on the webpage for this webinar, if anybody would want to come back to, to that. But I will go ahead and start with uh, a few of the questions. Um, let's see. Would compliance with an ISO standard for accessibility, such as ISO 30071, be a good starting point for PDAA? <clears throat> um, sure, it, it would. Um, I, I, some, I have mixed uh, opinions about whether you want to actually include a technical standard uh, in a policy because you know that that standard could change or get update updated and there could be some impacts you know to the organization when you when you do that and sometimes changing the policy it, itself depending on the how much bureaucracy there is in the organization it could take longer time so you don't have to put anything in there about the you know what technical standard you want to do that's in the in the second level of detail but i i mean I, i've seen it both ways you know, in the, in the policy, you're looking at or kind of overarching, um, you know, global governance and guidance. Okay, the next question. I'm curious where you typically see ownership of accessibility programs sit within an organization. I see IT as a stakeholder, but not owner of the program. How do you see organizations integrate their programs with other stakeholders like IT, HR, legal, compliance, et cetera? You know, it's, I've seen it um, in many, many places. Um, part of it really depends on what the culture of the organization is, <clears throat> um, is going to help determine that. For example, um, you know, if there's a lot of uh, power and clout in an HR organization, it could be that it could belong there. Uh, I've seen organizations where, you know, they've, they've put it in a place like uh, supply chain. And because that particular organization, you know, reaches across so many facets of, uh, you know, of, of a company that, um, you know, that, it, that it, it's effective there. So, you know, that's why I, I kind of put up that slide. You know, you really have to look at the pros and cons. There's no right answer. It's all over the map. Uh, you just have to kind of sit down with some, you know, uh, and do some critical thinking on that and make the right uh, compromise. And then again, you know, you could take that forward and the, the people, the, the part, power to be says, yeah, we don't want to do that. We're going to stick it over here. But, you know, should have some compelling rationale for where you believe that it should be within your culture and within that organization. Okay, thank you. So what's the actual risk of having non-accessible internal web tools in a company? I feel like sometimes I'm the only one worried about the legal risk around some of the tools my team designs. <clears throat> um, well, you know, ADA discrimination uh, lawsuits can come from anywhere. They can come from the outside. Uh, they can come from the inside. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know whether it's evenly split, but, um, you know, the, I put some other scenarios in, in the book that are kind of helpful. And I think one of them relates to, um, you know, somebody who's a, uh, a blind user who's, you know, they've been using this accounting software for years and it's green screen, easy for them to use. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden somebody, uh, they decide that they're going to upgrade and they automate and they buy a new system and it's got GUIs in there and it's not accessible. And this really uh, very valuable employee can no longer use these systems. Depending on how that works out, it could end up where that person is going to file uh, a complaint. So uh, the risk is, is everywhere. It's, um, you know, it really, it, it's no different than you know, than, than what you send out into the world. <clears throat> I hope I answered the question. Okay, let's see. Do you have any sample policies you're willing to share? 
Um, I, I really don't. And I, I mentioned that in the presentation. Um, I think you can go places like you can look at um, uh, Microsoft. Uh, you could look at some of the policies for universities. Some of the bigger companies are going to have those uh, published. Um, I think it really, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a, a perfect policy because, again, I intentionally leave that out because so much of that depends on the, uh, you know, the, the size, the, the purpose, and the culture of the organization. <clears throat> so I'm, I leave that to everybody to do. I don't want to use one as an example and everybody uses it and, you know, uh, hey, that's not really right. It's, it's just, um, you know, it's, I, I think that's up to the, the folks to try to determine. Okay, I'm going to move over to the chat for a second as we have some questions in there. It says, document PDF accessibility is difficult to achieve and very expensive on the back end. Building teams to create and maintain accessibility as a, as a business as usual program requires expertise and resources. How have you seen firms implement document accessibility? Is it typically on a risk-based approach, public-facing forms over marketing materials, or full-out remediation and maintenance of all documents on public sites? Um, I've seen all of those. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is important is to, you know, you want to prioritize um, the PDFs, you know, so there's things that are out there that maybe are not frequently accessed, you really don't want to spend a lot of time trying to go through and remediate those. You put a plan together that says if somebody requests this old document in an accessible, in an accessible format, you know, we have a, a method, a plan to be able to provide that within X number of days. Now going forward is a, um, you know, is something that you can, you can do. And that really is, um, you know, that's part of the governance criteria, right? You know, do you have uh, plans in place? Do you have tools? Do you have an approval process <clears throat> to make sure that, um, you know, that um, number one, the PDFs are developed in an accessible format and that they say, stay that way? You know, a lot of people will do a, uh, they do everything in Word and, you know, you can use all the structure and everything that Microsoft provides to make sure that you have a nice accessible document and you, uh, you know, you save it out as a PDF, but some of that that metadata can get lost and uh, screw up the accessibility. Um, there's also uh, companies who can actually, uh, <clears throat> you know, remediate PDFs for you. There's some other companies that have automated processes that can do that. So there's other uh, third party uh, vendors who provide products and services that can help do that at a, uh, you know, at a, at a larger scale if you need to. There's one company that, uh, I, I think uh, now even can actually uh, go in and remediate documents or allows you to remediate, you know, to fix PDFs without actually going into Acrobat or anything. It's, a, it's a, their own user interface that uh, provides that, which I thought was, uh, it was really interesting. Thank you, Jeff. The next question, did PDAA integrate the UN SDGs while creating the assessment? And secondly, what are the steps towards a roadmap towards readiness for corporations for the Agenda 2030? Um, <clears throat> I don't have the answer to that. I haven't, like I say, I've, I have been focused more uh, the last few years on the, um, uh, you know, on the U.S., um, of course, anybody is welcome to, you know, to pick up and formalize PDAA. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago. I think that uh, the state of Pennsylvania is looking to use it. Um, Minnesota and Texas are using it. Um, <clears throat> it certainly, you know, could be used by, uh, it, it certainly could be picked up in, in, any, uh, in any kind of a governance or uh, you know, regula regulatory body. Okay. We'll just take a few more questions I guess, and we can follow up you know, afterwards with some of these other questions. Uh, let's see. What kind of training would you recommend for organizations who have limited resources for creating their own? <clears throat> well, um, 
I would take advantage of the free stuff that's out there as much as possible. Um, you know, if you're tuned into a lot of the, um, you know, to the, uh, you know, LinkedIn and Twitter and you know, all of those, um, those things, you know, I see many of those um, that come across all the time. So I would take advantage of that. Um, I would also try to take advantage of, um, look at things like, um, I know that there are companies out there that now have uh, good robust LMS systems and I don't know, uh, you know, how the cost of that would be for others. Um, use a, we use level access within the state of Texas and I put a program together uh, in partnership with Level Access, where we have, where any employee with a state government ID or uh, <clears throat> state-funded institution ID can sign up and take uh, courses. Um, you know all the stuff that are offered in there, and they can either go in and drill down into one subject or take them from one to n. So it could be that if you have a really small organization, uh, maybe that's not affordable to you. Is it possible to maybe partner up with with somebody or <clears throat> or get a grant to uh, to do those things? You know, you're going to have to be a little bit creative about it, uh, and then take advantage of some of the um, you know Access U. I think is a good place to uh, to get some formal training. Uh, CSUN, although that was um, <clears throat> a little problematic last year because uh, they didn't really plan on this whole COVID thing, and and uh, but I would expect them to be readier for it. Uh, the M Enabling Summit is another one. So, um, you know, those are some advantages. And then uh, use that to train the trainers. So maybe you send one or two people to some of these, have them build the knowledge, uh, and then go back and train the rest of their, their staff. Okay. I'll just take a few more here. Does Texas have a repository for collecting um, artifacts related Rachel, to this? I'm not hearing you right now. Hang on, I might have to, um, can't hear you for some reason. Let me, I'm gonna reload this, which. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can okay, you hear me sorry. now? <clears throat> uh, what was the, the question after? Sure. The, the question has, uh, does Texas have a repository for collecting artifacts related to this, such as the risk acceptance forms? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, the way, you know, our, uh, we, Texas government uses kind of a, a federated model where all the agencies are pretty autonomous and we don't have a central repository. Every agency is required to, uh, <clears throat> to create those themselves, maintain them themselves. Uh, you know, they uh, they don't send those they don't send those to us. And part of the reason for that is we are you know we're a uh, uh, we do the rulemaking and consulting and governance, but we don't do enforcement. Okay. Let's see, let's do one more question here, and I guess we'll we'll put these together in a Q and. And post on the webinar page and send out when we do the recording and a copy of today's presentation. So we have one person that mentions that they're in higher education and it seems like these principles still fit. Do you see any other tips for higher education versus the corporate world? The principles don't fit. No, the principles still fit. So, oh, but they're asking, are there other tips for higher education versus the corporate world? Well, um, you know, the, 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 the complexity of higher education, you know, makes any governance models uh, challenging, you know, because, <clears throat> you know, you've got all these different areas and they're, they've got different procurement organizations and they're buying and there's not a lot of checks and balances all the way down to, uh, you know, professors who are buying stuff for their classrooms with no regard to accessibility. And uh, that can really get people into trouble. So um, I think what has to happen again is, you know, the, the universities themselves used to have a, need to have a strong 
uh, you know, governance model that reaches into all these different organizations and maybe, you know, puts some responsibility on the heads of these, uh, you know, the colleges or the others, other, other subunits <clears throat> uh, to do that. But, you know, one place where a lot of this comes together is procurement. And so if you can put uh, hooks into the procurement tools to where they, you know, make you stop and go, okay, you got to get the VPAT, uh, you know, put steps into those things. So you're using tools and not rules uh, that can be, that can be helpful as well. Um, you know, but I, I, uh, I sympathize with your problem. I see it all the time. Okay. Thank you again, Jeff. I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up there since we are over the time. But I appreciate everybody that stayed on to go through some of our questions and answers. I think we'll have this available on the webinar webpage and get that information out to you as, as soon as we can. So again, thank you, Jeff, for the presentation today. And thank you for our captioning team at, at AI Media. And we will um, we'll follow up with the recording. And okay. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening. All right. Everybody enjoy the rest of their day. Thanks so much, Jeff. You're welcome, Sam.